This lesson on HACCP principle number three, establishing critical limits, starts with one of the most famous stories in food safety history. In March of 1963, three Detroit women were clinically diagnosed as victims of botulism following a luncheon which included tuna fish salad sandwiches. Two of them died. Subsequent epidemiologic and laboratory findings incriminated Clostridium botulinum type E in commercially canned tuna fish as the causative organism. The Wayne County Health Department in Detroit alerted the Detroit Food and Drug Office on March 15th to a death believed to be due to botulism and to the hospitalization of a woman with symptoms of this horrific disease. The epidemiologic investigation by two FDA inspectors revealed that on March 14th at 11 a.m. the deceased Mrs. B, her hospitalized neighbor Mrs. M, who subsequently died, and her mother Mrs. K, who became ill, had a luncheon at Mrs. B's home. The meal consisted of tuna fish salad sandwiches, vegetable soup, and coffee, but Mrs. M had only a sandwich and coffee. Mrs. K joined them a little later and ate a small portion of the tuna salad that remained, and she had soup and coffee. Mrs. K stated later that the salad contained only two ingredients, canned tuna fish and salad dressing. Allegedly, while preparing the salad, Mrs. B had questioned the odor of the tuna. However, Mrs. M was unable to detect any sort of off odor. Both tasted the tuna and decided that it was all right. While eating dinner at home at about 6 p.m., Mrs. B complained of blurred vision, and she repeatedly took off and put on her eyeglasses. At 7.30, she went to bed complaining of difficulty in breathing and a tightness in her throat, as well as vision difficulty. The next morning at 6.30, Mrs. B was suffering convulsive respiration and could speak only a whisper. She was sent to the hospital in an ambulance but she was dead on arrival at 7.30 a.m. Mrs. M became ill at about 7.30 p.m. following the luncheon. She complained of dizziness, blurred vision, and difficulty breathing. Later her movements became somewhat uncoordinated and she vomited frequently throughout the night. Mrs. M was hospitalized at 8 a.m. the next day and given polyvalent types A and B botulinus antitoxin. Her symptoms continued to progress. On the fourth day after the luncheon, she was given type E botulinus antitoxin, but she did not improve. She died at 5 p.m. on March 19th. Mrs. K suffered nausea and vomiting about 24 hours after eating the small portion of tuna salad that she had, and she was hospitalized. She complained of a sore throat and she had some vision difficulties. Mrs. K was given 10,000 units of polyvalent types A and B botulinus antitoxin. She made a relatively rapid recovery and she was released from the hospital three days later. So the illness of the three women was diagnosed as botulism. They had eaten three items in common, coffee, bread, and tuna fish salad. About 5% of the dressing used in the salad was left in the one quart jar. Since a relatively small amount of salad dressing is needed for six and a half ounces of tuna fish, the dressing presumably had been previously used without ill effects. After sampling the canned tuna and taking stomach and intestinal samples from Mrs. B upon autopsy, it was determined that these women became ill from canned tuna contaminated with Clostridium botulinum type E. This particular type of botulism was usually associated with fish taken from cold waters. The bacteria can become toxic if not cooked under specified temperatures and pressures. So long story short, three women became ill from botulism after eating canned tuna fish and two of them died. But the story continued to develop as the public, the Washington Packing Corporation, and investigators dealt with the aftermath of this tragic event. After authorities identified the source of the poisoned tuna cans, there was a nationwide manhunt for tuna cans packed by the Washington Packing Corporation and imprinted with the telltale codes WY2 and WY3.
As New York officials discovered bad tuna sold under a kosher label, this sent inspectors to hundreds of grocery stores to search for the suspect cans. Unfortunately, the contaminated product was made for the Jewish Passover season as it was processed to meet kosher labeling restrictions. This forced the Jewish community to find alternative sources of protein. All the publicity made many Americans temporarily lose their taste for tuna. Yes, a careful shopper at a grocery store could check the lids of cans of tuna for the telltale codes XY2 or XY3, but it seemed much chancier to eat a tuna fish sandwich or salad made at a restaurant or drugstore. Executives at Van Camp's Chicken of the Sea had no doubt that this scare had an adverse effect on their profits. They estimated that it cost the entire industry millions of dollars. This was the worst news in the history of the $277 million industry. For a while, it was estimated that tuna sales were down 30%. The Washington Packing Corporation, whose tuna caused this nationwide scare and got the three women in Detroit ill, removed all of their cans of tuna from all grocery store shelves. They offered to redeem the purchase price of not only their brand of canned tuna, but any other brand to any customer who wished to redeem. This made the public curious about the fate of the San Francisco-based Washington Packing Corporation. After an exciting establishment of this company in 1962, management took several blows within a matter of months. They experienced a massive food recall. They had the grief over the deaths of the two women in Detroit hanging over their heads. Their profits suffered an incredible decline. The company kept its plant open for a little while as cases of tuna began to return to the company. Sadly, the company eventually ended up going out of business. It never recuperated from the devastating blow of having caused foodborne illness outbreaks. Four months after the Washington Packing Corporation packed its first cans of tuna, it closed the doors to this processing plant. After then, businesses came and went into this former processing plant for about 25 years. But in 1989, it became abandoned. In 2009, a demolition crew showed up to tear down this building that was well known for having processed the tuna can that ended up killing the two women in Detroit. Little did they know in the 1960s that I would use this story to teach HACCP principle number three. Now that you're familiar with HACCP principle number two and can determine critical control points, it's time to establish critical limits for each CCP. This part of HACCP is fairly straightforward, but it's important to pay close attention to detail. An accurate critical limit is crucial to the effectiveness of a HACCP plan. If a critical limit is not sufficient to control food safety hazards, the rest of the HACCP plan concerning that CCP and critical limit are irrelevant. After studying this lesson, you should be able to establish critical limits for basic critical control points, distinguish the difference between critical limits and operating limits, and discuss desirable characteristics of critical limits. The term critical limit has been differently defined by various organizations like NACMP, FDA, FSIS, and Codex. For example, the FDA says a critical limit is the maximum or minimum value to which a biological, chemical, or physical parameter must be controlled. It is the value placed on an attribute of a control measure at a CCP. At this chosen value, the control measure is effective in preventing, eliminating, or reducing the hazard to a safe level. My personal favorite definition is that of codex, which states that a critical limit is a criterion that separates acceptability from unacceptability. I like this definition because it helps me to simplify this HACCP principle. A food product is acceptable when it is safe. It is unacceptable at all other times. Therefore, critical limits in HACCP are used to distinguish between safe and unsafe operating conditions at a CCP. Critical limits can take on several different forms as listed in this table. It is very important to notice that only a few of the critical limits in this table would involve a direct measurement. For example, receiving temperature in a warehouse could be directly measured fairly easily, whereas it would be very difficult to measure the center of every single can of tuna going down a processing line with a thermocouple.
Instead, it would be much more practical to use indirect measurements, such as dwell time and temperature of the cooking operation, to predict the center temperature of a can of tuna. Indirect measurements can only be used when there is adequate data to back up the prediction and when there are adequate controls in place to make sure the conditions remain the same for the process that was validated. This is called process validation. Some of these conditions are things such as composition of the food, the humidity of the cooking oven, or the initial temperature of the food and the thickness of the food. So now you're probably wondering what exactly was the critical limit that the Washington Packing Corporation failed to manage? This is a great question. First of all, let's consider all of the hazards in canned fish processing. This table lists the typical types of hazards found in generic canned fish processes. You can see physical hazards such as wood splinters from pallets and fish bones, chemical hazards such as histamine and heavy metals from the water, and biological hazards such as salmonella and parasites. As we now know, the particular microorganism that caused the two women from Detroit to die was Clostridium botulinum. Known as CBOT for short, this microorganism is the most heat resistant of this list of microorganisms because it is a spore forming pathogen. When present, as in the form of spores, it takes an incredible amount of heat to make commercially sterile products. Experimental work and experience have shown that a process that achieves 12 log reductions of CBOT can be considered commercially sterile. The 12D process is established on the basis of an initial spore load of one spore per gram of product. Applying a 12D process reduces the probability of spore survival by 12 to the 12th or 1 million. Therefore, if cans contain one initial spore, then for every million cans produced and given a 12D process, only one can would contain a surviving spore. Practically speaking, a temperature of 121 degrees Celsius for three minutes is necessary to achieve a 12 log process. This is the critical limit for canned tuna. Something that is handy when managing critical limits is plotting and monitoring them using control charts. The advantage of control charts is they indicate when a process is trending toward being out of control, especially when documented on a control chart during processing. This gives the operator an opportunity to adjust the process before there is loss of control. In this example, the critical limit is temperature, which happens to be one of the most common critical limits in HACCP plans. The particular critical limit in this case is 75 degrees Celsius. Product cooked above this temperature is safe. Otherwise, the food is not safe. Now you can get an idea for how the cans of tuna processed by the Washington Packing Corporation likely caused the deaths of those two poor women in Detroit. They were probably not cooked above their critical limit. In the case of tuna canning, the x-axis on a control chart might be batches of tuna cans going through the retort. The critical limits should be 122 degrees Celsius and also three minutes. Obviously one control chart would not capture both of these data, so it would make more sense to plot something else like the process log reduction. Anyways, because control charts are so useful as tools in food processing, plants often establish operating limits to let the operator know when actions should be taken to prevent this loss of control. Operating limits should be kept separate from the HACCP plan, especially when there is regulatory oversight of the HACCP system. Critical limits, being part of HACCP, have become regulatory mandates and deviations from the critical limits require follow-up, action, and documentation. Under FSIS, this is especially burdensome. For these reasons, keep any operating limits out of the HACCP plan to avoid conflict and confusion. Here is a list of seven guidelines for what makes a good critical limit. You'll get more experience with these and they'll make more sense as you do so, 
But for now, make a point to use this list as a checklist as you develop your HACCP plan. First of all, critical limits should be easily and rapidly measurable. They should be inexpensive, they should be accurate and reproducible, they should be reinforced by verification data, use parameters that can be measured in real time, they should not interfere with or contaminate the process, and measurement procedures should be easy to teach and easy to understand. Whereas those were seven guidelines for establishing effective critical limits, next we move on to the three requirements for critical limits. And we've already talked about these to some extent. First of all, it's imperative to state on your HACCP plan whether the measurement is direct or indirect. Also, it's important to be able to scientifically validate the process. For example, in this case, we would validate that the temperature in the cooker and the time the cans spend in that cooker could actually predict the temperature inside the cans. And last of all, it's imperative that we're able to verify the actual temperatures inside the can. We'll talk about these concepts in more detail as the course progresses. You may commonly hear the HACCP process being referred to as a science-based food safety management system. The primary reason for this lies within the critical limits. Not only is the limit scientifically sound, but it also allows HACCP professionals to scientifically measure and analyze the process performances. Microbiological testing as a critical limit is usually not practical because of the complexity and the time involved. Critical limits must be quickly measured and they should give a clear indication of safe versus unsafe conditions. Traditional microbiological tests meet neither requirement. In addition to the sampling, preparation, isolation, and growth time, there is the element of interpretation. At what point does the product become unsafe? Any individual test is based on the sampling of a small portion of the product. The presence of pathogens in some situations is definitely an indication that the safety of the product cannot be assured. On the other hand, a negative test does not give a clear indication of the assurance of the safety of the product. Especially for those processing plants which fall under regulatory HACCP requirements, most critical limits established are traditional regulatory limits that have been used in the past. One advantage of using these regulatory limits is that departure from them usually results in increased verification data requirements by the regulatory agency. In the case of raw product control measures, such as those imposed by FSIS, there may be no way to validate the critical limits. Consider the cooling requirements for raw products and the zero visible fecal requirements. There is no actual value that can provide a point that separates a safe from an unsafe product. Patulin presence in apples is another example, as are antibiotic residues in milk. Sometimes the critical limit is chosen as detection limit of the screening test, such as an allergen detection swab for equipment or antibiotic screening for milk. An extremely good source of critical limits is a hazard guide that has been designed for your product by your industry association. Often industry trade organizations have regulatory liaison personnel who work with regulatory agencies to validate critical limits. For instance, the dairy industry manufacturers negotiated an agreement that the milk pasteurization temperatures and conditions should be used for the critical limit for juice pasteurization. This negotiated agreement saved individual plants from having to develop critical limits on their own. Having to do this could have resulted in considerable resources and time and equipment being devoted to establishing critical limits. Also, the USDA has produced a program that models the growth of pathogens under various conditions. This is a useful tool in finding a starting place for establishing critical limits or for a reality check for those limits already in use. The program can be downloaded on your personal computer and may prove to be a useful source of information. The USDA has also provided a database called Combase, which is designed to link expertise of researchers in the food industry, government, and academia. Combase software facilitates research cooperation among scientists studying predictive microbiology. This growing field estimates the behavior 
of microorganisms in response to environmental conditions, including food production and processing operations from the farm to the table. Using the database, scientists can enter data such as the temperature, acidity, and available water, and then retrieve all records that match that search criteria. The database already contains 25,000 growth and survival data records. It hopes to enhance the way predictive models are developed and applied to various food processing situations while ensuring that users interpret results properly. In summary, we've used the canned tuna botulism story from the 1960s in the Detroit area as a case study for establishing critical limits for basic critical control points. Now you should be able to distinguish critical limits from operating limits and determine desirable characteristics of critical limits.